This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Kreuter, the Bowtie Bandit of Blood, a transfusion medicine pathologist at Mayo Clinic. Today, we're doing another installment talking about COVID and specifically getting into a little bit of the nitty gritty about the uh, vaccine and also about laboratory testing. And so for that, today we're talking again with Dr. Ellie Thiel, uh, the Director of Infectious Disease Serology Lab here at Mayo Clinic. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Thiel. Thank you for having me back, Dr. Kreuter. Yeah, so let's get into, can you tell us a little bit uh, about the vaccines, kind of reorient uh, our leaders, our, our, our listeners to what we know about the vaccines at this point in into the December 2020? Yeah, so very excitingly, we now have two COVID-19 vaccines that have received emergency use authorization, one from Pfizer, the other from Moderna. Um, uh, kind of in, interestingly and intriguingly, they're both mRNA-based vaccines, which is kind of a, a new thing uh, for us. No previous vaccine has been authorized that's been mRNA-based. Um, and, and these are intriguing because they basically encode the spike protein of the virus, which is on the surface of the virus. Uh, they just encode the genetic material for that protein. It gets into the cells and it's basically uh, translated into protein, and then that protein is delivered through uh, various pathways to stimulate not only an antibody response, but also a cellular immune response, both um, primarily CD4 T cells, but also to an extent CD8 T cells. So it's really stimulating kind of a, a global immune response, which, um, uh, which, is, which is really important uh, for this uh, protection against this virus. Interesting. So the strategy of uh, using the uh, mRNA or approach, I imagine then, uh, you know, does this mean do these vaccines have uh, similar performance characteristics or how do, how do they look for how they work in uh, the public? Yeah, so, so far, based on the published uh, clinical trials data, efficacy is above 90 uh, 92, 95% for both of these um, viruses and for uh, Pfizer in particular, um, we really start to see significant protection compared to placebo um, at 12 days after the first dose. Um, and then that increases to over 95% um, efficacy uh, after the second dose. And, and it's very similar with the Moderna vaccine. So these really um, seem to be very effective at minimizing um, uh, severe uh, COVID-19 infections. Um, so they perform similarly. So I, I know you move in, in similar circles with a lot of our infectious disease colleagues. And, you know, uh, I, I'm certainly uh, looking forward to getting uh, my uh, vaccine, although uh, I think being a pathologist, I certainly understand uh, some of my other colleagues in the ICU, uh, ER, et cetera, being first in line. So I'm, I'm eagerly waiting uh, my vaccination at this point. But uh, what does this mean for me after I get vaccinated, hearing these really high numbers of, of efficacy as protecting me from the virus. What does this mean for how I, I should be behaving after I get uh, vaccinated? Yeah, I mean, I think all of us are excited to get the vaccine. Um, and we may, you know, we, we will be protected. We are protected after the vaccine, but we have to remember that we, there's still things we don't know. Can we still transmit the virus if we get infected post-vaccination? Um, and then there's, you know, other questions that we're still, we'll, we're still answering. And so, and because, you know, the majority of the population still isn't vaccinated, even after you receive both doses, we still need to be wearing our masks. We still need to be physically distancing. We still need to practice proper hand hygiene. So um, just because you get vaccinated doesn't mean that you're off the hook for everything mm -hmm. that we've been doing to protect ourselves over the past year. Um, so we really need to wait until more people get vaccinated before we can kind of minimize those um, safety practices we've developed a habit for. So let's dig into this a little bit, because I know you're, you're the director of really the Infectious Disease Serology Lab. So thinking about serology and a lot of the other um, you know, vaccinations, I know that maybe somebody might get vaccinated, but then 
sometimes I see we're, we're testing to see, uh, verify that they have these antibodies after they've been vaccinated. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what are the, the thoughts in your world for, do we need to be doing that kind of post-vaccination serology testing? What, what's the role for that? Yeah, so, so you're right. You know, For a lot of our vaccine preventable diseases, we do offer tests for post-vaccination assessment. Um, and that's, you know, commonly done for measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, and, you know, certain institutions, universities, for example, and other um, uh, employment or other facilities require documentation that you've been vaccinated, either by showing uh, paperwork that you've received the vaccine or demonstrating seroconversion. So that, that is done. The question is, do we need to do that after COVID? vaccination. Um, and right now, there is no recommendation to do post-vaccination testing uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, from all of the clinical trial data for both vaccines that have EUA, everybody, all recipients have seroconverted um, and have developed neutralizing antibodies. So that's, that's one. Two, um, we don't really know exactly how long these antibodies last at this point. We know that they last for at least three to four months from the longitudinal um, studies. Um, but we also have to remember that these vaccines stimulate, again, a cellular T cell response that antibody testing doesn't measure. Mm. And then um, finally, you know, we, we don't really know what level of antibody is clinically significant or associated with protection. So we don't yet know what that minimum threshold is. And then finally, um, there is no recommendation. If let's say you were vaccinated and you tested seronegative, at this point, there's no recommendation to revaccinate. So there's very few clinical decisions that you're going to be able to make um, based on an antibody test at this point. And so we don't we don't really recommend that. I right see. Now. Plus, we're at this standpoint now where, you know, we we don't have enough uh, vaccinations for the, the population. So, I mean, I can understand that. So so given that that's where we are, um, my next question for you is, uh, has from your standpoint in the laboratory, has has for laboratory medicine, has has the course been run for uh, what work? You, know, you guys have been uh, pedal to the metal. Uh, I think probably, you know, uh, if I remember talking with Dr. Benneker too, you and him have been uh, pedal to the metal since uh, I'm not sure if January, February of 2020. So you guys have been going at it pretty hard. Is, is, is have, have we now developed the tests that we needed? Um, we got the yeah. vaccine coming out. Is, is laboratory medicine's job done and, and you can get a, a, a very well-earned vacation or <laughs> You know, are your folks in uh, research and development still uh, have some things that need to get done uh, in lab medicine? Yeah, so um, I would say that, you know, a laboratorian's job is never done, right? There's always something else to look at. That being said, it's we, we don't have that sense of urgency that we did um, in early 2020. So for example, when it comes to antibody testing, one of the, um, I guess, new kids on the block, if you will, are the semi-quantitative or quantitative antibody tests that are coming out, a number of which have EUA. So we are actively looking at those and we'll probably implement um, one, at least in, in the lab. The question that comes up is what does a number from one of those antibody tests actually mean? You know, you report a 10 versus a, a 200. What's the clinical significance of that difference? And, and right now we don't know. Again, we don't know what um, minimum antibody threshold level is clinically significant. There's really no international reference standard against which these quantitative assays have been um, standardized against. Um, so you can imagine there's going to be some variability in, in what's reported from assay to assay. So mm -hmm. there's, there's still a lot to be done. I think we're going to learn more and more about the durability or the longevity of these antibodies. I'm really hopeful that at some point we will achieve a minimum threshold that's clinically relevant 
um, which we have for other vaccine preventable diseases like tetanus and diphtheria and measles. Um, so there's still work to be done, definitely, but we're not feeling that intense pressure um, that we did in, in early March. And then um, to add on to that, uh, you know, when it comes to vaccine detection of a vaccine induced uh, response, we have to make sure that we're using the right test. So again, the vaccines stimulate antibodies to the spike protein, um, whereas the current antibody tests we have are either detecting antibodies to the spike or the nucleocapsid uh, protein. So if you have in your lab a nucleocapsid-based antibody test, chances are you're going to have to implement a spike-based antibody test in the future as well. So definitely work uh, to be done. That nuance is really important uh, for us all to, to understand. And uh, is, is the fact that we have a couple of these variations out there just kind of a testament that, you know, this was testing that needed to kind of be brought up uh, in the moment. And so that's why there are a couple different strategies that got developed and why maybe over time we'll see a convergence towards one or the other, or is there a reason to continue in, in going forward years ahead, uh, keep these different assays up because um, it really needs to be a battery uh, yeah. in order to be accurate. So, you know, for internal Mayo Clinic um, testing, we brought up a nucleocapsid-based assay for, for various different it, um, reasons, including just enterprise-wide standardization. Now we're working on also implementing a spike-based assay to be able to detect that vaccine-induced response. So um, you're right, you know, we, when we had to bring up an antibody test, this is what we had, this is what we brought up. Um, and so now we're kind of playing catch up um, to make sure that we're offering all of the potentially needed antibody tests in the future. So we, can, we can't forecast um, exactly what we'll need um, all the time uh, early on in a pandemic, so. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Thiel, for taking the time to, to talk about this with us. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. We've been rounding with uh, Dr. Thiel talking about uh, the COVID uh, vaccine and implications for laboratory medicine testing. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions by email. Please direct any suggestions to mcleducation at mayo.edu and reference this podcast. If you've enjoyed Lab Medicine Rounds podcast, please subscribe. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through insightful conversations.